Well, welcome. Um, yes, the uh, this is a bit of a advertising title, as you probably can tell in terms of overstating the situation. Uh, how to guarantee your church stays focused, free grace. Now, it really is a uh, is issue. I don't know if you've seen this. I've seen it, where there is a. Uh, uh, in terms of how, how does the church stay free grace, I'm going to give you a, the brief answer first. But I, where the situation is that there's a free grace pastor at a church, they've been preaching faithfully, and uh, and they retire, they depart, and then the church goes another direction, just whew, just like that. And it's like, wow, that's really something. So, um, you know, we have to think through this a little bit more. So. The general answer in how does a church uh, stay free grace really is this. The metaphor is it just has to be the DNA of the church. And it has to be pervasive in the church. Okay. Now, I am at Grace Community Bible Church. Bill and Mary attend our church. And Bill uh, has been an elder at various times at our church. We are in process in terms of the lead pastor's free grace, I'm free grace, Bill's free grace, and there's other people that are, but we have not achieved pervasiveness yet in the situation. So uh, as long as the leadership is in place at this point, we're good. But we have to think a little further beyond that down the road in terms of things change, if things change unexpectedly. And so it starts with leadership, but it's not limited to leadership. In one sense, that's a not enough. Leadership is not enough. It's got to go beyond that. Um, so here, you know, we here we have some leadership here. We have some other other people, uh, but this is in terms of pastors. But and it, it starts there and then moves to the board. But even at our church, we have like nine board members, um, and they will be at various places. They're they're gonna they they're just gonna be at different places, and that's what I'm gonna talk about a little bit. So uh, don't think that we have got this totally solved and figured out. We have a, a direction that we need to go to make this happen so that if we lose the, lose the pastors, the church, we don't lose the church in terms of it doesn't go someplace else. So in the Bible, you, as I'm just going to go through some passages you're going to be familiar with. With respect to leadership, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. Able to teach. There's a teaching requirement in terms of what they do. In 2 Timothy 2, um, the Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be uh, kind to all, able to teach, again, patient when wronged, with gentleness, but notice, correcting those who are in opposition. There's correction involved. There's a, there's a truth issue, and we have to correct for it. Um, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. We sometimes tend to think that's with respect to um, non-Christians or unbelievers. No, and he's talking about people that are getting off and the leadership's responsibility to help keep them. And that includes uh, correcting. It does. And then in Titus 1.9, he says, um, holding fast the faithful word, which is in accordance with, with the teaching, so that he will, and he's talking about church leadership again, he will be able to both to exhort in sound doctrine that's the positive side, and refute those who contradict. It's a responsibility of leadership to do those things. And it's interesting, when Jude was writing, uh, as you may be aware, he was in this one chapter book that he writes, he says, I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation. That seems to be what he was wanting to write about. I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all handed down to the saints. Contend. Contend for the faith. So, um, you know, there's, there's activity involved with this to keep things uh, uh, in line. Now, back to the question of how do we get this to be part of, the, uh, part of the church culture, the DNA of the culture. Let me give you 10 suggestions, things that, that uh, we're doing. And, uh, and I'm sure, and you guys may have some other ideas besides. I don't have the final list on this thing at, in any sense. But we do have to be intentionally thinking about this because it's just not going to accidentally happen. So here's 10 specific suggestions. Okay? Now, let me just state the obvious one first. We need to preach on it. 
Okay? And everybody knows that. Preach it. Preach free grace. Absolutely necessary. Absolute starting point. Absolutely important. Okay? But there's a problem. The mistake is usually this. The conclusion is, if I preach on free grace, they will hold to free grace. Now, did you notice the change in the pronouns? I, they. Big assumption. I will preach on free grace, they will hold to free grace. Not necessarily. They may hear you week in and week out, and what you say, but they may not be buying it. They may not even be thinking about it very much. There, that is not an equation that works. Maybe they get it, maybe they hold to it, but we can't assume that. And that's the scenario I've seen where there's a pastor that's leading a free grace church, and he departs, and when they're going to go get a new person, being a free grace pastor isn't a requirement. They go by, you know, is he a good speaker? Does he tell good jokes? And personality or whatever. Now, the person faithfully taught free grace for years, okay? And a bunch of people got it, and a number of people hold to it. But when it came to selecting the next pastor, not a criteria. So this is the kind of the classic mistake. With um, Benjamin Bloom, has anybody, it depends on if you're into education stuff, you've heard of taxonomies of, yeah, okay, taxonomies of educational objective. One of the things we have to understand is that there's progression. If you hear something and then you remember it, that's great, that's down here, remember it. If you understand it, that's even better. Uh, if you can apply it, that's better. If you can analyze, evaluate, and create. So notice there's a progression in terms of depth of understanding that people have concerning whatever topic. This is just a secular guy that is presenting this, but he's acknowledging rightfully that there's different levels of understanding from very basic to comprehensive. And we will, just to oversimplify it a little bit, not meaning to be, to be his diagram, but people have opinions. And then some people, they don't only, not only have opinions, but they have beliefs. They have a belief, and some people have, even have convictions. Now, notice the difference? And there's various depth to where people are at. And so what we're doing has to help people just not be able to repeat what we say. But we really need people to understand it. And with free grace, we need people to defend it. We need people to be champions for free grace. But that's up here, okay? That's up here. And you don't just get there uh, by, you know, them listening every week. It takes more than that to get there. So, I'm, I'm going to give you a second suggestion. Here's a phrase. How many of you heard this? Words create worlds. Word create worlds. Anybody heard this phrase before? I'm still not exactly sure what to think of this. Uh, it's very popular in some circles. Words are critically important, uh, but I, I'm not sure. But it's an interesting phrase, and I think it has a good point that language makes a difference. Language makes a difference. And so I think if we want to have a church where free grace is, is permeating the church like DNA, we have to have phrases that we say we, and, and that we use regularly so that people become familiar with them and understand what they mean. For example... Uh, Jesus plus nothing. Jesus plus nothing. Phrases like that. Jesus is enough. Adams Road is a group of uh, former Mormons that do, uh, and their family is from our area, and they have t-shirts and stuff. Jesus is enough. Joseph is not. Okay? So, and then if we're going to define things, do we define them clearly? Here's, here's in my opinion, the irreducible minimum. Believe in Jesus for eternal life. I, I, I can't reduce it any more than that. And biblically, that seems to be the best we can do. Well, are we clear? Do we say this often? Do we have other people say it so they, you know, they learn it? Another one, what does the text say? What does the text say? Okay, um, That's another good phrase. People have, a, <laughs> you can be sitting in a Bible study and people have come up with all kinds of ideas and, and I'm going... Okay, now, now where in the passage did you find that? Where is that? And you're driving them back to where does the text say that? Because uh, sometimes people just are happy to give whatever their opinions are. 
Um, and then my three rules for interpretation, context, context, and context as well. Um, get people to, to know that and say that and think that way. There's some more uh, phrases, Jesus' performance, not mine. Uh, I'm a zero-point Calvinist. Um, Bob just did a, uh, a video on that. Um, changing the word from gospel to message of life. Gospel is very broad, and uh, it's, it's good news. And there's all kinds of different good news, good news of the kingdom and good news of other stuff. And so uh, message of life, though, that's what we're about uh, understanding what does believe mean? Um, persuaded or convinced that something is true. Persuaded or convinced that something is true. A lot of people don't, they never pause to think what believe is. And I remember sitting across from a guy and he's like, I mean, he said, how do, you know, I was telling him about believing in Jesus. He's like, well, what does believe mean? Like, Who knows what believe means? I said, no, actually I do. Let me tell you what believe means. You don't seem to know what believe means. Let me tell you what means. Being persuaded and convinced that something is true. That's what we're talking about here, okay? Uh, but people are, there's kind of all over the map. So using these kinds of phrases. Pardon? Oh, I sure did. Look at that. Lost the signal. It did not persevere. So, okay. Well, okay. Oh. Okay. My, my point is, have some agreed upon language. Because I don't know if words determine worlds, but words capture culture. Words keep culture. If we're using the phrases. Now, you guys can decide at your churches what words and phrases you want to use, but find ones that, that you're really comfortable with and that you want people to say, and so that there's some commonality in language and people know what it means. Uh, that'll help permeate it into the DNA of the culture. When we do a uh, new to grace class, we explain to them, we go over our beliefs and what we're about and expectations so new people can get instructed from the beginning. In our new to grace class, it isn't a membership class, it's a two-part class where we are telling the people who Grace Community Bible Church is. That puts them in a position to decide if they want to be part of grace. Okay, But we try to be as transparent as possible. Instead of having somebody attend for a year to find out what a church is about, we say, Come to this two-part class. We will tell you. And then you can ask whatever question you want. But we be straightforward. We're not, a, we're not a Calvinist church. We're not a Reformed church. We're not a Lordship church. We're a free grace church. And so new people coming into grace, they know it. They got it from the beginning. Um, we're, you know, we have to get a lot of the older people caught up a little bit. But the newer people got it. Okay? Um, give grace New Testament commentaries to the teachers. Have the church pay for it, you pay for it, I sometimes pay for it, and you put that in their hands. Uh, they'll tend to use what is right in front of them and what's available, okay? And so that can be very helpful. Another thing is uh, believe testimonies, not works testimonies, okay? Believe testimonies, not works testimonies. And uh, the difference here is, uh, uh, and Catherine has written about this, a works testimony is before the conversion and after. So it'll look something like this, overstating it. I was an evil drug dealer. I had a dramatic experience of some kind, and now I'm nearly perfect. Okay, there you go. And, and what happens with people, I don't know if you've had, I've had this happen so many times. They'll come up to me and they'll say, you ought to hear their testimony. It is really something. It is almost always that. It's almost always that. That's what it is. Tell me about the one that the kid that grew up in the church and learned, learned about Jesus and just believed in Jesus and didn't have to get damaged through life before coming. To, now that's the one I want to hear. That's the one we want our parents and kids to do. Is the kid who grows up and believes in Jesus because they're there because their parents believe in Jesus. Now that's the one I want to hear. That's the one I want to put up front. That's the one. Okay. So not the works oriented one. Instead, have a faith or belief-oriented one. Belief. Uh, often people are saying, well, I'm trying. I hope I make it. Don't know. And then they believe in Jesus for eternal life. And then afterwards, they have certainty of eternal life. That's really my testimony right there. I grew up in a church. I was baptized as a baby. And if you'd asked me like when I was a senior in high school, well, think you're going to make it? Nobody did. But if somebody were to ask me that, I said, well, 
I'm trying. I hope so. I don't know. I believe in God. I go to church some. They baptized me when I was a baby. When, it, when they weigh the scales, I'm, I'm hoping I come out on this deal, but I don't know. Kind of a thing. And then as a freshman in college, I believe in Jesus and found out that there was this great passage, 1 John 5, 11 to 13, where it says you can know if you have eternal life. I was like, why didn't, everybody, why didn't anybody ever tell me about that one? That's a good one. Nobody talked about that you could know if you had eternal life or not. They just come to church and do whatever. So, uh, another way having to do with faith and belief is I didn't even believe in God. That might be, and the person does come to believe in Jesus for eternal life, and then their testimony is, well, what is it that changed their mind? What is it that changed their mind? That's a great testimony to hear. How, what did God use to get your attention to believe? And so, we will, when we do baptism videos, when we do baptisms, we do videos of the baptism. So, and, and I record them. I sometimes coach a little bit, make sure they're doing okay, so that we have a testimony that's right in terms of being presented. And let's see. Okay, the sound is not going the right place. Give me a moment. Try that. Hello, my name is Eleanor Rico. I'm getting baptized today. Last year was a very difficult year for me. I had doubts about God, doubts I had never had before. But when the summer rolled around, I went to Bible camp. I've never gone to something like that before. And I have to say, it was a, an amazing experience. <coughs> During and after, I felt closer to God. The music and the lessons really touched my heart. And helped me grow in Christ. And a couple a couple weeks ago, I went to the fall retreat. It was awesome in itself. But what really made it special was the connection I felt, not only with God, but the people I was with. I'm here today because I want everyone to know that I believe in Jesus for eternal life and belong to Him and Him alone. Now, you may look at that and you may say, well, uh, that's a pretty feelings-oriented uh, kind of a thing, okay? Um, but she's, she's explaining how God worked in her life. I don't change her story. Uh, but she, we talk about believing in Jesus for eternal life to make sure if that's true in her life, um, it, that that's included. So the statement is clear. Now, these, these baptismal videos still vary. They really do. Um, this one isn't like a poster child of the example I just was articulating to you, but just an illustration of, of what can be done. And I think that helps reinforce free grace in a church. Q&A individuals through James 2. It's very interesting. I've, I will teach on James 2 in my class, you know, 35 to 50 people. I can teach in James through, and a few people it'll click with, but whew, uh, a lot of going over the heads. What I've found is I will sit down with somebody across the table, I'll take my Bible, I'll go to James 2, and I'll open it up, and I'll put it in front of them, and I say, okay, let's start at, actually, I don't start at James 2.14, we read the 19 times that they're called brothers in James. We start with that, 19 times brothers, and then we get to 2.1, where it says that there talks about their faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. They have faith. And then we go to 2.14, I say start reading, and then I ask them questions. And I make them process it. I have found this very workable. It also takes an hour and a half <laughs> for them to see it. But then they see it. Me just telling them, we're back to the whole preaching thing. Well, if I told, it, then if I told you, then you should have it. Well, not quite, okay? Not necessarily. So, um, but then these people have it, and, and, and it, it, is, it is so much fun. Light bulbs go on. You can just watch them. They're going, oh, I never saw that. Does that mean this? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, you got the idea. It's a great time, truly. Give out grace and focus articles to people. Uh, I think Charlie Bing's grace notes have a lot of great information that are really helpful. Um, this is from uh, Norman Geisler that I had at Dallas. 
use two column charts, not the counterfeit dollar bill thing. The counterfeit dollar bill is not right. That isn't the case. It doesn't work. If you're dealing with Mormonism in Utah, counterfeit dollar bill doesn't work. They use all the same language. You, you can't sort through it. That's not the issue. You need to know what they're doing in terms of counterfeit. But even with free grace, um, some people will say works are necessary to confirm saving faith. And they'll say that's, a, that's the issue. Uh, works are necessary. Instead, works are necessary to be useful to, and, and to grow. That's really the case. It's a sanctification issue. Works are not a justification issue. And so if you spell it out like that, in our case, Mormonism, faith and works are required. Reformed, a faith that produces works is required. A grace perspective, faith alone, apart from works. And so if you can spell these out, and of course in this book with these four views, what's interesting, works will provide evidence that one actually has been saved. Works will provide the criteria by which Christ will determine the eternal destiny of people. Works will determine rewards, but not salvation. And works will merit eternal life because of the union of the believer with Christ. Three out of four works are required. Only one of them doesn't. Which one? Which position? One, two, three, or four? Three. Or three. Three. One, two, or three, four? Three. 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 Yeah, that's Bob Wilkin. That's number three. It's the only one that doesn't say works are required. Okay? But people need to see this sort of thing. Let me, so those are kind of specific ones. Let me give you five more general ones, and then we can take some questions. Um, give people time to think and process what you've presented. Sometimes people have never heard a free grace perspective before. They have to think about it for a while. Give them, give them time to think. Give them time to think. I remember this has happened repeatedly where I'm studying something, and I go see, and I read what Zane Hodges says. And I'm going, nah, I don't think so. No, 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 no. Okay, I keep studying the passages. Come to the passages. Keep looking at it, keep studying it. And then I come back and I'm like, huh. Boy, I think he's onto something there. But it takes me time. We have to give other people time to process, especially free grace stuff. Um, don't make everything about free grace. Now, you can push back on this. But the concept is... Uh, I don't like it when the Reformed people take their theology and cram it into every verse, whether it's there or not. Okay? I don't think we should do that. If the passage is not really talking about free grace, it's talking about something else, we'll talk about what the passage says. Don't Now, in our messages, for example, we try to be, make a point of talking about believing in Jesus, a free grace message of life at the end of every sermon, but, we, but every passage is not about free grace. Okay, so just be honest with the passage. One of the, I, I'm on, this is something I'm on at the moment. Eliminate Christianese. The, I'm, talk, I'm talking to more non-Christians all the time. Christianese doesn't mean a thing to them. Doesn't. And I'm finding out it doesn't mean a thing to a lot of Christians either. <laughs> so I'm like, so try to say it in plain language. That's an interesting communication thing. How to say it without using Christianese. Okay. I think it's a valuable exercise. One of the things that's very helpful is show how a free grace perspective uh, makes passages more valued and relevant. And it really does. Whether it's 1 John or whether it's James or it's Hebrews, it's like, oh man, we've been missing the message on these books. But free grace helps us to see what the message is. Be gracious. Be gracious. This can show up a lot of different ways. Here I'm doing a sermon. I'll... Uh, let me suggest that it's at least a minor example of being gracious. And then he goes on to say, for he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted. Sound familiar? He's forgotten his purification from his former sins. Yeah. He's writing to believers. If believers are not doing this, he says they're blind, I think, to spiritual realities. They're short-sighted in terms of thinking about life. And they have forgotten their purification from their former sins. Okay. Most people want to read this for he who lacks these qualities is not a believer and going to hell. That's how people want to do this passage. They want to say, if you don't have this, if you're not performing, then you don't make it. You don't make it. But it's not what the passage says. It's not what the passage says. Here's the point. I have covered two of three points, and I am out of time. 
<laughs> so you all are going to get two of three points today. Okay? So let me wrap this up. For believers in Jesus Christ who have eternal life, God has... Okay, that's me being gracious from the front. Now, some of us are so committed to our message and so committed that, boy, these people got to hear what I have to say, and they're getting tired, and they've been sitting there for a while, that it's my message is more important than you sitting there. Okay? And it's like, nah, we're out of time. I'm going to stop now. Did the, did the point in another... You got all three points this morning, by the way, on, on that passage. You got them all three. I got them condensed down so I could, I could get through them in the, all three of them. Okay, but be gracious. Meaning... Be thoughtful of the other people. Put yourself in their perspective. If we're going to talk about grace and free grace, we should, be, we should be some of the most gracious people there are. We should be gracious and kind with people. That should be... I think we need to be mindful of uh, generations. I'm getting caught on this as a baby boomer. Um, I'm a little bit... I periodically get myself in trouble. I'm a little bit of a bull in a china closet with millennials and Gen Zs. Um, we just... We just come at it from different places. Here's uh, uh, my son, Michael, who's right on the line uh, between a millennial and a Gen Z. Uh, he's been helpful, and I think we have to be mindful of this. Now, the second major influencing factor in millennial culture was access. Millennial generation was the generation coming of age in the Internet. They were coming through the AOL instant messaging and the starts of social media that became what it is today. And that highly influenced their culture and how they operate. Part of that could be the addiction to technology. However, at this point, every generation is addicted to technology. Because technology is, in fact, designed to be addictive. It's really scary. If you've not looked into it, it might change your view of technology. Uh, but millennials were impacted by something much more specific in that they had access to every news of anything around the world at all times. And that influenced how they viewed the world. Because what kind of things would they see when they're looking at news every day? Well, you know, maybe they can find some cat videos that are hilarious, but they're getting the bad stuff. They're seeing the evil in the world regularly. They're seeing the destructive, broken governments. They're seeing the war and the impact of war in people's lives. They're seeing the influence of poverty for people. They're seeing the sex scandals in churches. They're seeing the evil things. And this has led to another distinctive part of their culture, which is authority. Millennials distrust authority. They've seen it break. They've seen it be a problem, so they don't trust it, which means they don't trust your church. They don't trust the leaders in your church. They don't trust the government. They don't trust the educational system. They've seen it break. Maybe they experienced it break. They maybe saw the family unit break personally or through a friend. So they distrust authority. They don't have a reason to listen to you unless you give them a good reason to listen to you. Kind of interesting. Um, you can look that up. He did a whole session. This is just one of his points. Uh, but it's been helpful for me to interact with my son. Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, phrases to avoid. Phrases to avoid. <laughs> this, uh, this is probably going to be more, uh, you know, um, baby boomer kind of stuff. I don't care. You know, somebody tells me something. Like that. And you may, inside, that would be completely true. I don't care. Okay, well, we can't really be running around saying that. We can't really be saying that. Uh, in our head again, we may be saying that they're just idiots. They're just idiots. Um, once again, you can't let that escape your mouth. That's part of the point. Now, this one sounds really spiritual. God said it, I believe it. That works for truth-oriented people, okay? But that's not where everybody's coming from. And so this is, is viewed as a non-thinking approach. A non-thinking approach. Um, and so we have to be mindful of that. Judging statements, making judgments, that uh, typically not very helpful. Um, 
statements that are better, you have to kind of take the edge off of some of the things. I'll use this, and, and you know, I, can't, I couldn't use this in a theology class at Dallas Seminary, but when I'm talking to people, I'll say, well, let's go see what God's opinion is on this. Because people are open to this concept of, let's put different opinions on the table so I can kind of decide, well, let's, let's put God's opinion on the table. Have you thought about that? What does he say? Let's take, let's take a look at that. And it doesn't sound so forced. It doesn't sound this authority hammer thing. Um, and so I find people very, uh, once again, younger people, very open to that. Well, let's see, let's see what God's opinion is on this thing. Something for you to consider. Now, do you see what that's doing? It's letting the person, you're respecting what they're going to decide. Here's something to consider. Or asking them questions. Well, what do you think? Instead of me just giving what I think. Kind of a deal. If we disagree, you say, you know, I, I don't see it that way. Rather than saying, you're wrong, you're an idiot, say, you know, I, I don't see it that way. And of course, you all know this, but I'm just going to remind you, grace and truth. Grace and truth. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. I think the order is important. It shows up in verse 17 as well. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth was realized through Jesus Christ. We lead with grace. We don't, Jesus didn't compromise grace, and he didn't compromise truth. But he led with grace. And it's kind of interesting, because in the Gospel of John, in the New Testament... The book that uses the word truth the most is the Gospel of John. And in the beginning, he's talking about grace and truth. And usually a prologue will say this is what's going to be talked about in the book. Grace is only mentioned four times. Truth is like 36 times. What's up with that? Let me make a suggestion. Um... Truth is spoken about because it's truth, but grace is demonstrated. Grace is, what, the way we get grace out of the Gospel of John is Jesus and what he does. When we hit John 8 and the woman caught in adultery, pure grace, pure grace. Didn't use the word, by the way, pure grace, okay? And so I think we need to lead with grace, not compromise truth, and that's what I think a GES perspective does. Our emphasis on God's truth, but grace. And so uh, those are just some of my suggestions, but we have to frame this as I need to get the DNA of the church, not just leadership, but the rest of the church. So if somebody in a class, somebody comes in and starts teaching something else, the people in the class say, hold on a second, no, that, that doesn't sound right. No, that, that's not what we hold to here. We have to train our people to be discerning on that sort of thing. So anyway... Those are my suggestions. Um, I'll take some questions. Not that I have the answers, but there's some questions. If you have some. Yeah. The Q&A um, in, in uh, James 2, what kind of questions? You were talking about you were starting discussion yeah. questions. I, I don't know if I have any specificity there. Yeah, well, you didn't. I did a workshop on it last year, so that's where the specificity was. Um, but I'll say, I'll turn this over. I'm using the New American Standard here. And I'll say, okay, read verse 14. What use is it, my brethren, if anyone says that he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? And I'll say, well, what's, what's the topic he's introducing here? Now realize, and I'll say this to people, I'll say, you know, when you're reading something, it's about a topic, and then the, as you go into the passage, he's going to talk about the so topic and say something about it. The topic, and he's going to say something about it. And I say, so what is our topic? And he says, they'll say, well, faith and works. I'll say, no, that's what he's going to talk about. What's the topic? Well, I, I, and they'll look at my face. I said, the answer's not on my face. It's in the passage. Look at the passage. Okay, so what you said, my brother and family says, yes, faith. Well, okay, it's about faith. Well, it is. He's going to talk about faith, but that's not the subject. What's he talking about here? Uh, you got to go earlier in the verse. Push back earlier. I said, go to the beginning. What use is it, my brother? I said, okay, now, right there. What use? Use, yeah, that's, he's talking about, he's writing to believers, and he's saying, well, now what use is this? That's the topic. And what he's going to talk about it is that faith and works, faith without works, is not of use. Not useful. Okay, and then when he, when he drops down, and he gets to 16, which is just a little ways down, he uses this example of not giving food to somebody, and it's a brother or sister, it's a fellow Christian, and he says, what use is that? 
He, this is the subject. What use is it? And he demonstrates that with Abraham, his willingness to sacrifice Isaac was useful in growing his faith to maturity. Rahab's willingness to hide the spies was useful in delivering her and all of her family's life from temporal destruction when Jericho was destroyed. He's making the case for how useful it is for believers to act on their faith. But I need them to see it. So I'm asking, I'm just doing Q&A. Does that help a little bit at least? Yeah, it is. I, I think then, and how do you make the transition? Um, it's, it's, I feel like it kind of leaves a usefulness. Okay, now well, how do I, I guess now it goes to the next level. Now how do I apply it? Is that where you were showing in that pyramid earlier? Is that Where are you going with that? What is your thought? I'm, where I'm going with that is I want them to discover what the passage says, not what I told them the passage says. That's the process I'm going through. Do you see it? And I don't know if they see it unless I ask them questions and they tell me. That's the feedback. And that's the part that's cri- critical because me just telling them doesn't mean they got it. Them telling me and me asking them questions, now I know if they got it. And I want them to have ownership higher up on the pyramid. Bill? Um, one of the points you didn't mention, and I assume you do this already, but uh, who you control, that, who you allow to be teacher. Yeah. Right, so I, I'm the gatekeeper on who teaches and, and what we use. So there needs to be a gatekeeper. I do notice on some of our curriculum, you know, kids, yeah. there's a little challenge. Yeah. There is. Yeah, because yeah, we, 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 some of the stuff is answers in Genesis, and so, um, but we're trusting you to straighten that out. <laughs> and you do, yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you had mentioned many you know, proactive things you can do. But, uh, could you comment on maybe some reactive things? I think it's back to those passages I did at the beginning that we have to have to do some correction on stuff. So if somebody is presenting something that's not right, and and then we have to address that and say no, that's that's not the case. That's not the case. So I think that gets to be kind of a case by case thing. But rather than being passive to let stuff go. You still know, well, let's talk about this. What are you meaning by that? You know, and say, well, actually, that's not what we teach at our church here. And um, particularly for people that are teaching. And that, that's my category, so I can, I have responsibility in that area to talk with them about what they teach. So is that, you, is that a general idea? No, we're we're running about 160, 165 at the moment. Okay. And so okay. So um, I guess reactive could be a couple different things depending on how long you've been maturing with the church. How do you get a pulse for um, the uh, the atmosphere? You know, where you can maybe feel like it's starting to veer, or there's people that are coming. You've got new people coming in all the time. They come into the groups. How do you how do you get that? How do you what kind of listening campaign do you use, or what kind of strategy do you use to get the pulse? Okay. We, uh, we just have to talk to people, and we have to listen. But we're particularly focused on who's leading stuff. So not just the elders, but the teachers in different positions. Um, we, we have an elder board, and then we have ministry teams, and so we have team leaders. So elder board and team leaders are key people. Um, and it depends on if they're doing teaching or what exactly they're doing, but those are the ones that we have to keep track of. Now, new people coming in, the New to Grace class lays it out clear. And, and we'll have people that say, no, that's not... Uh, yeah, uh, and we'll say, you know, isn't it good that you know this now so you can make a decision instead of attending for a while and finding out this isn't the place for you? That saves everybody a lot of hassle. So um, let me close this up because I'm done, and then you can just ask me questions after that, okay? So let's pray. Dear Jesus, we want to thank you for the message of life that we have the responsibility and privilege of sharing with people and the teaching of God's Word. Help us to do that. Help us to be people of grace and truth that don't compromise truth, and that the message of your free gift of life is clear in the churches where we're at. Help us to um, be part of the DNA that preserves the church with that truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.